The uh, Stirling engine, if someone wanted to describe briefly, uh, which is an ingenious heat engine uh, that was run at pressures very close to atmospheric pressure, so that you never have the really high pressures involved in a steam engine, which had led in the past to boiler explosions and people getting killed uh, when things weren't run right. Uh, it was the, uh, the human danger in those that led uh, Reverend, I believe it was Robert Sterling, to invent this engine uh, in the, I believe, the very early 1800s. And <coughs> the Sterling engine has a, uh, in principle, it's a very high efficiency. And because it's run at low pressure uh, or close to atmospheric pressure, uh, it, the um, building one doesn't require the very fine tolerances around the piston that steam engine or gasoline engines or so on like this do. Uh, so hobbyists in uh, this era have uh, had a whole lot of fun with building them themselves using uh, sometimes machining parts out of metal in their home lathes, but uh, other times building them out of spare soup cans or uh, uh, plastic syringes and test tubes and things like this. You can build Stirling engines in a lot of very simple ways. I'll give the basic design of this here, and then I'll show you one. So the Stirling engine runs, um, you have a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. And you have a, uh, let's see here, you have a uh, uh, chamber here, let's say a cylinder, well, it is a cylinder where there is a loosely fitting object called the displacer. It is not made to be tight. And what it does is it, if it's on the hot side, it simply takes up room and, mean, and moves the air over to the cold side. Well, when that happens, the air being in contact with the cold reservoir, it contracts and it uh, uh, takes up less volume. So the, uh, let's see here, what's the, we look at the diagram properly. Eh. The one that's uh, described in the book is a slightly different model than the one I want to describe here. Uh, anyway, this is one version of a, of a Stirling engine, and uh, they have what are called the well, alpha and beta types. And I just realized that the one in the book, whose diagram I was about to draw, is not the one I'm most familiar with, which is this kind here. This guy has the large chamber with a loosely fitting displacer. That's this plastic area here, and there is the uh, black painted piece of styrofoam, white on the bottom, uh, which is the displacer. So if it's up like that, let's say you've got the hot side down here and the cold side of the cylinder is on top, which is just going to be atmospheric temperature. Now, if you place this in contact with a hot reservoir, when the displacer is down like this, When the displacer is down, then the air is in contact with the cold reservoir. It contracts. Well, the contracting air, let's say that we've got here, uh, there's not maybe a proper diagram here, but Oh, this is correct. Okay. So the air is then, uh, as it contracts, it pulls in a more tightly fitting piston connected to a, uh, uh, a driving rod. So if the air contracts in contact with the cold reservoir, it pulls the piston in. 
and then it turns your flywheel here. All right? Around like that. Now, the thing is, is that the flywheel is connected to the crankshaft. And as the flywheel turns around here, that crankshaft, and I won't show the linkages, that's the more complicated part, moves the displacer over to the cold side, which moves the air around it, you've got this room, to the hot side, at which point the air expands and it pushes the driving piston here out. Well, by that point, the crankshaft has gone around here, and so it keeps going this way. That moves the displacer back, and it may move, shuttles the uh, uh, air to the other side, and it keeps going on, uh, going on like that. So in this case, here's your flywheel. The, this design has the drive piston right there, uh, that's the, sorry, this is the driving cylinder. The piston is tightly fitted right in here. Very small, notice. And it's connected directly to the chamber where the uh, displacer is, is uh, placed. And the displacer is quite loose. You can see it's shaking in there. Like that. Okay. Now, in this version, the... Uh, two connecting rods, one for the displacer and the one for the drive piston, are offset by 90 degrees. Pretty close to 90 anyway. Yeah, right at 90 degrees there. And uh, then as one, one goes around, there we go. So they've got that 90 degree uh, out of phase uh, setting. Okay, see if you can see the uh, drive piston here moving somewhat out of sync with the displacer. Now, I have a cup of hot water. And I'll see if I can zoom in on this. All right. Okay, so I just microwaved this water here. Unfortunately, I think it's starting to cool off a little by the time I walked across the cold uh, quad over to this area. First of all, notice that nothing's happening yet. One thing about the Sterling engine is that they always require a, uh, a start to them. You have to give them a kick yourself. Now, if I do it this way, I happen to know which way when the hot side is down here and the cold side, room temperature is up here, I happen to know that it's going to go this direction with these veins leading into it, rather than the way where they're sort of bent. Uh, so it's the cut end heading in. Watch what happens if I try turning it the other way. Okay, if you go for a minute. But it rather quickly comes to a stop. I'm actually doing work against the natural flow of heat. Heat wants to flow from the hot side here to the cold side, and we, in allowing it to move through, we extract useful work. So what happens if I give it a kick this way? All right, now it is slowing down a little bit from my initial push. Let's just see if it can sustain that. Yes, it's just got enough of uh, uh, the temperature of the uh, uh, coffee cup, still just high enough to keep it going, barely. The larger the temperature difference, the faster this thing will run. And unfortunately, the design that we've got here, while the very wide displacer and the short, the shallow stroke and wide uh, uh, cylinder for the displacer allows it to run on very low temp uh, differences in temperature, which is good. On the other hand, the people who made this one made it out of plastic, which is an insulator, an insulator for heat. So it is very difficult for it to uh, run um, you're blocking the flow of heat 
rather than allowing it to go through. If you made this out of metal, especially on the bottom, it would run much better. Uh, they just wanted it to be completely see-through. Well, the reason, by the way, that they've got the top side transparent and the uh, displacer painted black is because if you set this out, especially on a cool day, in direct sunlight, Turned off in a second. If you set this on a uh, uh, out of direct sunlight on a cool day, then the bottom is the cold side, and the top being hit by sunlight, and that black paint there is the hot side. Okay. The um, engine is starting, the uh, bottom side there is starting to get up to the operating temperature now, and so it's picking up some speed. And this can run for a good while on that, even on that it's cool enough for me to touch now. I had, when I had it up near uh, boiling temperature, it was really spinning on a wall. Designs which have a narrower and longer uh, cylinder for the displacer to run in will we'll need higher temperatures to work on. But at the same time, they will be able to run a whole lot, uh, they'll put a lot more power out. See, this thing is very low power. I can stop it just like that. And again, once it's stopped, because of the way that these cranks work, it will need a push to get going again. So, those things are really handy. We'll go on from there on to on to a refrigerator, practical refrigerator design. Before I mention real refrigerators, I should talk about the fact that in theory, a refrigerator could be nothing more than a heat engine run in reverse. Well, a real refrigerator can be made out of a stirring engine because while it, and notice that it's continuing to move because the bottom side here is still warm. It's now um, been raised to a higher temperature by sitting on that uh, cup of hot water. So it'll continue for, to run for a while until the bottom side lowers to the same temperature as the top side, and then it won't be able to run. In fact, once it gets to within about three degrees Celsius of each other, it won't be able to run at all, uh, just from this design. Now, by letting heat flow from here to here, I'm able to extract useful work. So what happens if I do work on the flywheel, and if I turn it the other direction? In that case, we're taking it, running it, uh, rather than a heat engine, which runs always runs clockwise around a pressure volume diagram, a PV diagram. A refrigerator runs counterclockwise, is driven that way by a motor around the PV diagram, and you wind up pumping heat from one side to the other. So if I hook up, say, an electric motor to this flywheel, and I run it this way, do it by hand, but it would uh, uh, not do it as well, if I run it this way, over time, what I'm doing is I'm pumping heat from the top side to the bottom side. Notice how quickly it stops by the way. So I'm still working against that temperature difference right now. So if I just kept doing that, I would wind up pumping heat uh, from here to here. Let me make sure. This is the hot side right now. This is the bottom side that flows the other way. Okay, yes. If I do it this way, I will wind up moving heat from here to here which means that I've turned it into a refrigerator. I will pump the heat that way. And so a stirring engine run in reverse will make an actual refrigerator, not a very high power one, but it will work. Okay.
More practical designs use compressors and uh, uh, condensers and things like this. So let's take a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. I'm sure those are both on the screen. Okay. Let's say we have a compressor over here. Instead of a gas running all the way through, uh, we're going to take a fluid, and uh, we're going to have it vaporize and, li and condense, liquefy. So let's start off with a compressor. Symbol for the compressor pump there. Okay. So. At point one, we start off taking our uh, working fluid through the compressor. To run the compressor, we need to do work on the system. So there's a little electric motor installed in that. Okay. Now, um, we have this, uh, we compress it, we've, we've got it turned into a gas, uh, we take it through a condenser, which has, uh, let's say, veins and such. Let me check on that condenser. Okay. Yes, I was making sure I hadn't confused the condenser and the evaporator down here, but really they're the same kind of thing. They simply have pipes and veins that are in good thermal contact with, in this case, the hot reservoir. That just gives it a lot of surface area, and surface area is where the heat is transferred on the surface of the uh, uh, a boundary between the working fluid, or in this case it's a gas, and the hot reservoir. The same thing between the working fluid and the working fluid and the cold reservoir. You just have to have good thermal contact. So the condenser there, it gives off heat to the hot reservoir. So that's Q H. Let's see, it's point two, point three there. We go to what's called a throttle, and I'll explain that in a moment. That's point four. And then finally, we're in through the evaporator, which is could be built the same way as a condenser. A lot of narrow pipes and veins in order to get good thermal contact. And it's in contact with the cold reservoir, so the uh, fluid evaporates and it uh, goes from its uh, uh, liquid state up to uh, gas. Although it's not, it's sort of in between during the evaporator. There, we're back to step one. Okay. Oh, and QC is absorbed from the cold reservoir here. Now. Let's look at a PV diagram of this. Starting at point one, we have an adiabatic compression. Let's see, I need a little more space here. There. An 
adiabatic compression from point one to two. Okay, the compressor takes it up here uh, with no heat flow. It does it very quickly. From two to three, we're running through the condenser in contact with the, uh, the uh, hot reservoir. So it's run through at constant pressure. From three to four, we drop the pressure through the so-called throttling process. Now, at this point here, uh, it doesn't draw out quite as well in the PV diagram. We're just going to put a dashed line in there. We go from here to here because we're not really analyzing the work done from the PV diagram. We're not running with a, uh, an ideal gas because we have a phase change from liquid to spill, from liquid to gas and back. So I'm just going to put a dash in there and not worry about the details. Okay, so that's the problem. And then from four back to one, we go through the evaporator at constant flow pressure. Okay, here, QC enters the system, and here, QH leaves the system. Now, just like we had with the Rankine cycle for the steam engine, we have a change of phase. And so let me draw out where the liquid and gaseous phases are and that mix from the in between. All right. Through the condenser at point three, just after it comes out of the condenser, it has just condensed into a liquid. But it's on the, just on the boundary of the liquid to gaseous phase change. So we have here. Like that. Now, as it's come through the, uh, when it goes through the evaporator, we have just gotten it up to a gaseous state here at point one before it goes through the compressor. So it is a gas, it has just uh, become a gas, evaporated to a gaseous state here. It is pushed by the compressor to higher pressure, so it's more uh, uh, deeply into the gaseous phase here, and then it transforms into a liquid, it condenses here. So a gas phase is like that. Now, in between these two, you've got a mixture of liquid and gas together. It's liquid plus a gas if you can't read it there. <clears throat> okay, so the rest of this is all in the liquid plus a gas mix. All right, what we want to do is to find the efficiency again. Now, since we can't run it straight from the PV diagram because it's not an ideal gas, it's not all the way through, uh, we're going to have to run using the enthalpy again, just like we did with the Rankine cycle. Now I realize I just said well, we're going to find the efficiency, but for a refrigerator we don't talk about efficiency, we talk about the coefficient of performance. And recall the coefficient of performance in its basic form is benefit over cost. For that matter, efficiency of a heat engine is benefit over cost. 
So the benefit is how much heat we pump out of the cold reservoir, because we want to make it colder. And the uh, quantic cost is the work done, which is the electricity we run through the, uh, uh, the compressor. Now, from the first law of thermodynamics, we know that, among other things, the work done is the difference between the hot and the cold heat flow. We had actually written originally QH equals W plus QC. So, I'm going to put this in here to get the coefficient of performance entirely in terms of the heat flow. Now, recall that um, we're going to analyze it like the Rankine cycle or a steam engine in terms of the enthalpy change. So, enthalpy, H equals U plus PV. Okay, recall that. Now, putting in uh, delta H is delta U plus P delta V. P is constant. This is just from the uh, earlier lesson on the Rankine cycle. And if we have a, uh, that's a constant pressure, and if the there is no change in that. We wind up using the first law with this to come to the conclusion since so let's see, delta U is Q plus W, and the work is going to be the opposite. The work is negative P delta V. This is delta H is going to give us positive P delta V. Those cancel out. And Q equals delta H if pressure is constant. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, you can just look that up from the previous lecture. QC is equal to H1 minus H4 and the heat that flows out during the uh, uh, through the condenser is H2 minus H3. And recall that the order, I didn't do final minus initial in both of these cases because I, I arranged the order uh, to make both of these be positive because we are taking by convention QH, QH, QC, and W all to be positive for heat engines and refrigerators. Okay, putting all of these in here, both of these in here, the QH and QC, and Let's see here. We've got QC, H1 minus H4, QH minus QC, no, Q2 minus, sorry, H2 minus H3 minus H1 plus H4. Okay. So what do we do about this in practice? Well, we can look up these in tables, the enthalpies of the different states. Um, but H1, H2, and H3 can be done in tables. H2, where is H2? Is going to be one of those tricky ones again. We're going to wind up assuming that S1 equals S2. That is, that the entropy at points 1 and 2 are the same. Let me show you on the PV diagram again why that's the case. As we run from 1 to 2, we're taking it through the compressor adiabatically, which means that there's no heat flow, Q equals 0. That means that we can, um, since uh, for quasi-static processes like this, um, since delta S is Q over T and Q is 0, delta S is 0, which means S is constant. So the entropy at point 1 is the same as the entropy at point 2. And just like we did with the Rankine cycle, we'll wind up taking that entropy to be the same and interpolating, just like we did before. Now, to find the enthalpy at point 4, however, we've got to do something else. Okay. 
So assume S1 is S2 and interpolate. That's a fancy, that's a very bad and symbol. There we go, plus. Okay, now to find the enthalpy at point four. We need to look in detail at the throttling process. Okay, throttling in this case is a process called the Joule-Thompson process. Now, the throttle itself uh, is, it is a constriction. Think of throttling meaning, you know, a choke. Uh, it's a constriction. So the pipe goes down through a very tiny hole or a series of very small holes. The gas can flow through it, but it uh, only a little bit at a time there. And uh, you could even have a porous material uh, be the, uh, the new thing that blocks the, the free flow of Okay, a helpful way of looking at this is to think of it as having, uh, see what the pressures and the volumes are of every little bit of gas that goes through the throttle. Take a look, oh, gas plus a liquid. Let's imagine that the pipe, as it goes through the throttle, let's see. I've drawn there the plug with a bunch of little holes drilled in it. <coughs> Microscopic, perhaps. All right, so let's say on the left side, we've got the, it's flowing here, from here to here as it goes through the throttle. Now, I'll have a piston here. which is compressing the gas on this side. And I've got another piston over here, which is expanding the gas on the right. Okay. A key thing about this is that we have a constant pressure this, this compression is done here in a way that maintains a constant pressure on the left. And this expansion here is done in a way that maintains a constant pressure on the right. So, I'll call the pressure on the left side pressure initial, PI. That's a constant pressure. And we have a constant pressure, PF, or P final, on this side. There. Okay, now, we have a, uh, some initial, as the gas goes from here to here, it takes up some initial volume, VI, on the left, and it expands to fill some final volume, VF, on the right. Okay, and we're going to have it where the initial pressure is higher than the final pressure. Now, in compressing and expanding, we're doing work. The work is done. Um, they have opposite sign on these two sides. So we've got the work done by this compression on the left, and we've got the work done by this expansion on the right. Okay, I think that we've got this set up now. 
Now we take a look and derive the equations we need. <clears throat> a key thing is, is that we do this in such a way that there is no heat flow. Well, maybe it's clear from this. If we have this insulated here and here, there is no heat flow during the throttling process. Okay, so Q is zero. From the first law. Now, I should write that one up here. Delta U is Q plus W. Heat flow is zero. That leaves us with, well, delta U. We've got final minus initial. So the energy in the final state here on the right minus the energy on the initial state in the initial state here on the left equals the total work. Well, the total work is the sum of the work done on the left and the work done on the right. Notice that I didn't label work, work initial and work final. That would have been confusing. It would have looked like I was supposed to subtract one from the other. But work is not a state variable. <coughs> okay. Now, for the work, we have a constant pressure on the left and a different constant pressure on the right. So I put in W is negative P delta V for constant pressure. For the left, I've got minus pressure initial, this is on the left here, times delta V. Well, what's the delta V? It's not this versus that, or you know, that minus this. What the work done on the left is we start off with some initial volume here, and we wind up compressing it all the way down to zero. This piston moves in here until it's touching the throttle. So the final volume on the left is zero. So final minus initial, zero minus VI. Tell you the truth, I think I might have uh, mis-explained this when I wrote this as this is the initial and final volume of the gas moving through. Really, I should say, this is the initial. I've drawn the initial volume of the uh, of the left hand side of the cylinder of the, of the left hand side with this uh, operation, and this I've drawn the final volume of the um, what it looks like when the expansion is done here on the right. The expansion starts off at a volume of zero and sucks the gas in, stay very loosely. So. Here we've got, let's see, negative P times negative I, so positive PI VI, that's work on the left, and work on the right equals, okay, negative P final there, times, well, the initial volume, so final volume minus initial. So this is the final volume here. Minus, well, it started off being right up there and it pulled out, so that's zero. So I've got negative PFVF for the right there. Okay, I'll put those two in and see what I've got. Okay, but so what? Well, what I should do here is rearrange so that I get all of the initial terms together on one side of the equal sign and all of the final terms on the other side.
What I've got is u plus pv, which is enthalpy. Oh, actually, I've got that off the screen. Anyway, enthalpy h is u plus pv. So this is the final enthalpy equals the initial enthalpy. Well, isn't that something? This has been a constant enthalpy process during flow. Triple exclamation point. How are we able to do all of this and not change the enthalpy? You'd think that we were changing the enthalpy. It's because it's not an ideal gas. If this were an ideal gas, then Because, uh, let's see, energy is equal to F over 2 in KT from the, uh, um, the equal partition theorem. So this is proportional to temperature here. And PV, well, PV equals NRT or NKT for, the, uh, for an ideal gas. then we would have the enthalpy would be proportional to the temperature. But what we're doing is we're lowering the temperature in this case. So that part there fails. PV does not equal NKT for this working fluid, as we'll call it. OK. Um, so we're able to lower the temperature while maintaining a constant enthalpy. This means since the enthalpy on this side is the same as the enthalpy on that side, as we've gone through the throttling process, then the enthalpy at point 3 is equal to the enthalpy at point 4. And when we put that together with the coefficient of performance, So I've got H1 minus H4 over, oh, uh, what was it? Yeah, it's the same one too. H2 minus, that's a minus sign there, minus H3 minus H1. Was that correct? Yes, I wrote that correctly. Plus H4, there in the denominator. And now I'm saying that H4 equals H3. I'll put it all in terms of H3. So I've got H1 minus H3 in the numerator divided by H2 minus H3 minus H1 plus H3. Yeah. And now I've got it as something that's a workable form. H1 minus H3 over H2 minus H1. Again, for enthalpy at point 2, we take the entropy at two and three to be, sorry, at one and two to be constant and interpolate in the tables. And there we go.